Welcome to our ongoing discussion of types of structural action. We've been focusing on tension for quite a while. This is from Chapter 1, Section 6, and we're labeling the tension topic uh, point 1. And this is our sixth uh, video dealing with the issue of tension elements. And in this case, we want to focus on resisting wind forces. We all know that there can be wind pressure on walls. <clears throat> this is Dulles Airport, and this is the flat wall at one end. It's a glass wall that is backed up by steel trusses. Um, and these trusses work both for inward pressure of wind on that wall and outward suction on that wall, both of which can be very significant forces. In this wall, we don't have any trusses, though, and the reason is that this wall has been curved and these mullions can serve as tension elements uh, for wind pressure on the outside face of this wall. So this is a tension element, that's a tension element, and then we have beam-like elements spanning between those tension elements. When we have wind suction on this uh, wall, these elements go into compression and they act as arches. What may be slightly less well understood is that we can have wind suction upward on a roof also. And most people have seen images of roofs being ripped off of houses in hurricane winds. So we, we, we pretty well understand that this phenomenon exists. And later on in the course, we'll talk in more detail about the physics of the Bernoulli principle and Venturi effects. And um, we'll even talk about quantification of those wind loads in terms of air pressure correlated with wind speed and so forth. But for right now, we just want to understand that wind suction can occur and it can be extremely turbulent. So basically this cable type structure or tensile structure will flap wildly in the wind and basically uh, tear itself apart due to the stress amplification of this inertial effect. Um, so this is the roof of the Dulles Airport. It is supported by these very delicate uh, steel cables. Um, and to help hold it down, they put concrete planks spanning between cables. And you'll notice there's a double cable here. One cable supports the end of this plank, and the next cable is going to support the end of the next plank over, which is not in place yet and can't be until the tension elements get uh, added here. But the upward suction on a roof like this might be on the order of 20 pounds a square foot. Uh, these concrete planks would be more on the order of 50 pounds or 60 pounds a square foot. And so there's enough dead weight in this roof structure to hold it down against that upward wind force. Um, and this shows uh, people actually pouring the concrete on top of that. And one of the interesting things is that um, during construction, the shape of these elements, tensile elements, will change as load is redistributed. So you'll see on the roof here a bunch of sandbags that get distributed over the entire roof. And then as they pour concrete, they throw the, the sandbags off. Um, in other words, they're trying to keep the constant uniform pressure or weight of material there so that as the concrete is curing, as it's added and as it cures, the structure doesn't constantly change shape. Okay, so this might be a diagram of what you just looked at, where each one of these might represent the mass of one of those concrete planks holding it down, but we've shown breaks in between because there isn't continuous connection between those planks. Now, a structure like this can still have wind load problems because under wind load, it might lift up here and go down further there, or lift up here and go down further there. So you can end up with a deformation like that, or like that, and it can go back and forth. And I refer to this as the sloshing effect. And we still need some kind of bending strength to resist that. So I've kind of indicated that here by giving some continuity along the length and some thickness. And in the case of the Dulles Airport, they actually achieved that because you'll notice how there's a gap between these planks. What they did was they created some formwork down below, 
Uh, and when they poured the concrete over the entire roof, they let it go down into this groove. So they ended up with some structural depth uh, at every one of these uh, locations so that that added some stiffness to the roof and stopped the sloshing deformation. Here's another example of that. You'll notice this sort of beam-like element here, which is used to stiffen this roof. And that beam-like element also tends to work in compression, but mainly it stops the asymmetric deformation under wind suction. So here we have a tensile roof. We have a strut at an angle here and an one here, and those have been designed to express this outward sort of leaning effect, similar to the Dulles Airport but they're nowhere near heavy enough to resist the inward pull of this roof. So you'll notice that everything here is a bipod. <clears throat> There's a vertical element and then the sloped element. And the designers wanted you to see the sloped element and ignore the vertical element. And so they've painted the vertical elements black. So they sort of recede visually and the sloped elements they've painted white. And so that's what your eye focuses on. This is what that structure looks like on the inside. Now, we can have the same kind of sloshing effect <clears throat> in a suspension structure. So you'll notice there's a stiffening beam along the edge of this structure, which is supposed to resist this kind of deformation. Unfortunately, this beam was not deep enough. It's only eight feet deep and 2,400 feet long, and we'll learn that that's absurdly outside of the uh, proportions that we would need for a structure like this. So what's happening here is we're actually observing a sloshing effect where in this structure on one side, the, the cable is pulling up and the road bed is riding up, and then on the other side, the cable is then able to go down and the road bed goes down. And on the other side of the bridge, it's exactly out of phase with that, where it's going up on this side and down on that side. And when you look down the road bed, it looks like a torsion because it's sloped this way there and it's sloped that way there. And that's one way to interpret it. And if it was torsionally much stronger, we would not have seen this kind of deformation. But to first order, it's basically that kind of sloshing phenomenon uh, and the bridge is so torsionally weak that one side can do one thing while the other side is doing something else and they're not closely enough coupled together that they have to do the same thing. So one way we deal with that is we, we build things with much deeper proportions. So in this case, this particular beam was eight feet deep and 2,400 feet long, if I recall correctly. Uh, in the Golden Gate Bridge, it's an even longer span, but they've gone to a much deeper structure here. So these trusses are on the order of 30 feet deep to stop that kind of undulating motion or that sloshing effect. And this is the Bay Bridge. Those side trusses are even deeper on the Bay Bridge. And on the Bay Bridge, they decided to take advantage of that by putting a roadbed below and a roadbed up above. So it's, it's a double-decker bridge, basically. This is the Golden Gate Bridge. Uh, you'll notice there's a very long span from this tower to the next tower, and the width of this bridge is only about 90 feet, and it's 4,200 feet long. So under wind loads to the side, so uh, forces going in this direction, we need some structure that resists that. And in this particular truss uh, uh, structure, there's a horizontal truss under the roadbed. There's a horizontal truss down at the bottom, which has crossing members like this. And then there are vertical trusses on each side. So we end up with a box truss, which is torsionally extremely sound and also very good at resisting both vertical movement and horizontal movement. But it's the horizontal trusses in this plus the diaphragm action of the roadbed itself that is responsible for resisting forces in that direction. Those forces get transferred off to the tower and then the tower has to carry that load down to the foundations. Um, and by the way, a really crucial point is uh, this structure up above is rendered as rigid frame 
It's not fully triangulated, which makes it somewhat less efficient, but it also is part of the beauty of the Golden Gate Bridge. Down below, you'll notice it's fully triangulated, which allows the large forces that are delivered to this roadbed, for example. Those forces are able to get transferred through that cross bracing all the way down to the foundation. So because there's so much larger shear force or horizontal force being exerted on this portion of the structure than there is on that portion, uh, this portion has been articulated as fully triangulated. They could have triangulated what was up, up above, but it would not probably have been nearly as beautiful as it is. All right, so here's another example. Here we have suspension elements through the center of the structure. Uh, this particular structure is the Oakland Alameda uh, Athletic uh, Arena, which was designed by Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill. And they also used a concrete roof, but it didn't have to be very heavy because, in essence, this thing is like an inverted dome. It's suspension under the downward forces of gravity, but on the upward forces of wind suction, it becomes like a dome, and domes are very structurally efficient, so it didn't need really thick concrete to hold it down. This is what that dome looks like, and you see those suspension elements running through the interior. Um, And this is a view, and by the way, this dish has been filled in to a large degree with all this mechanical equipment. Um, but literally, uh, water gets pumped out of this system um, in order to keep it from accumulating in the center. Now, we can also use uh, cables to support a roof against gravity. So here we have some suspended cables in the Dorton Arena which are there to resist gravity loads. Those cables could fly away, but because we've shaped this roof correctly, we can then throw some wind cables over the top to hold down the roof under wind suction. So we literally end up with two structural systems. One is this gravity system, uh, or the, the draped elements in that direction to resist gravity, and then there's a second set to resist wind, so that structure looks something like this. These are counter-tensioned cables, and because of that, we don't need a bunch of mass in that roof uh, and probably don't want it because uh, it would just add unnecessary gravity burdens. This is what that structure looks like from the air. This is what it looks like from ground level. And in the book, there are a lot of different examples of these sort of saddle structures with draped gravity cables and wind cables thrown over the top of them. Uh, there are lots of different ways to do this, but this is a particularly beautiful example. This is what that looks like on the interior. And all these elements up here, by the way, are just acoustic elements. The roof is actually corrugated decking. You might be able to see that here. The corrugated decking is running in that direction. And it's connected to the cables that go this way um, by U-bolts. Uh, so it's a kind of combination of this really elegant structure and then when they get right down to the decking it's fairly primitive and get the job done kind of mentality. Uh, these are the uh, tension elements in the roof that we talked about before. The fact that the material comes in and splays outward here. Uh, these U-bolts are adjustable via these nuts to achieve the tension that's necessary. These are lighter cables which come across and they are adjusted with this turnbuckle mechanism. Uh, this arch is actually supported. This is the arch that swings around the roof and it's supported by uh, these columns. So you have this eight foot wide arch which is supporting the inward pull of the gravity cables and, and then it rests on top of these vertical elements which are working as columns, but are also bending elements under wind load against the glass. So here are some other examples of these kind of saddle structures. Here we have gravity cables, here we have wind cables. To keep them from slipping past each other, 
the wind cables have actually been sewn through the gravity cables. Um, here's another example of counter-tensioned uh, curvilinear uh, cabling system. These are uh, structural models that were done by students in ARC 332 in previous years. These are pretty challenging to do and the students who did these projects did really beautiful work. This is an example of what you don't want to do. Uh, we said previously you've got to have curvature in order for cables to work so you'll notice everything here has curvature. When you do this every member is straight. It looks like a saddle surface but from a structural point of view none of the members are effective. So this is not what you would ever want to do. Okay, that ends our discussion of resisting wind force on tensile structures.